There we go. I can hear myself coming through. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to what promises to be a, uh, a fascinating and uh, interesting and inspiring conversation between our uh, two psychotherapists. Um, my name is Sarah. Uh, I'm wondering if I'm the only non-psychotherapist in the room tonight, possibly. I'm certainly going to looking forward to learning um, much more um, from Martin and Brett. But um, I'm the Chief Executive of the UK Council for Psychotherapy, and we're really proud to be hosting this evening with you. So I'm thrilled and excited by what we have in store this evening. So please give a warm welcome to Martin Polikoff and Brett Carr. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. You started very young, didn't you? And how did you actually get into this? Because we have a lot of people who are older when they start, but we, we want many more people. I think it's great to start young. Yeah? Well, first of all, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and, and thank you all for, for joining us tonight. And I'm very grateful that we have our wonderful chief executive and our wonderful chair facilitating the evening. I feel very, very pleased and honored to, to be here. And many of you will know Windy Dryden, Professor Windy Dryden, who yeah. really is probably the, the, the absolute top founder of, of, of you know, cognitive behavioral uh, and cognitive rational emotive therapy in this country. I'll, I'll never forget, I was at a meeting, it must have been in the mid-1980s, and it was full of a lot of very old, stodgy psychotherapists and psychoanalysts talking about how one needs, you know, a thousand years of analysis before one can begin one's training and all of that. And, and Wendy Dryden got up at, uh, and he raised his hand and he said, you know, at my course at Goldsmiths College, part of the University of London, we take people in their 20s. And the the reaction in the room, you, you could mm. hear people gasping with shock. And it really evoked an enormous amount of concern that people in their 20s had a role in mental health care. Mm. Well, this is not a problem for trainee psychiatrists who are all in their 20s, or indeed for trainee psychologists who are all in their 20s. But I think something did happen historically in the development of British psychotherapy, where we really aged ourselves up as a profession quite quickly. The UKCP mm. has a more diverse age range, but another one of our organizations, the British Psychoanalytic Council, I, I was, I was, of which I'm also a registrant, I was told that uh, we have fewer than 5% of members who are under the age of 50. Now, mm. so, so because, you know, because the training is long, we, we, we have attracted people. It, it is good to have emotionally mature people, and not everybody at 20 is emotionally mature. But, but yeah. it, has, it has proved problematic in terms of bringing new juice and new energy into the profession. But, but Absolutely. But there's no proof, is there, that age brings wisdom? I mean, if, if, if you look, is there any, have you noticed that? It doesn't necessarily bring wisdom, does it? Uh, at the same time, you've got kids, so at school, everybody's asking mm. for advice. Mm. You know, and it's those sort of people we really sure. like to attract to... No, I think, we do, I think we do need... I'm glad you raised the question of age. I think we mm. absolutely need to, to reach out to, mm. to young people. And I think we're, we're at a very, very exciting moment in, in British history in terms of our, our understanding of psychotherapy and our attitudes towards psychotherapy. Because, as you say, I, I got uh, roped into this field at a very, very young age. I think but didn't I, you self-rope? I, 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 I did. I did. I did. Right, you weren't dragged rope. into this, were you? <laughs> uh, absolutely. I, I think I had. I think I must have known by about the age of sixteen that I wanted to do something. I mean, I, 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 mm. I didn't know what the difference was between psychiatry and psychology and psychoanalysis. Mm. Just like most people, I had. I had to learn. But I knew I was attracted to the letters P S Y. I knew. Right. I knew it was quite intriguing. But at that point in time. Uh, people were not encouraged to go into the profession at all. In fact, my, my teachers in psychology, who were very distinguished academics, when they discovered that I had an interest in reading Freud, they were horrified. And they told me, if you waste your time reading these people who are not scientists, you're, you're going to fail, you're going to drop out. Mm. Uh, they, they literally said to me, Freud is 50 years out of date, and he has been completely 
disproven. So I don't think that there is quite that same fascistic mentality now. Mm. And we're at this remarkable moment in, in human history, especially in this country, where we have so many of the young members of the royal family embracing good old-fashioned talking therapies. Prince William and Prince Harry, their mother was, was very proud to be a participant in psychoanalytically orientated, Freudian orientated psychotherapy for a very large period of time. None of us are supposed to know that, but unfortunately the, the media absolutely violated the privacy of both the late Her Royal Highness and, and her psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. So to have spokespeople like that, such as Prince William and Prince Harry, I think this is the first time in history mm -hmm. that psychotherapy might be verging on being somewhat cool. When I came into the field in the late 1970s, people looked at you as though you were really, really doing something very, very weird. The, the typical reaction I had in the 1970s when I said, I'm studying psychology and I'd like to practice psychoanalysis one day and so forth, they said, ooh, why would you want to spend your life with crazy people? That, there, there really, really was a sort of turning up the nose, a real sense of disgust. Mm. And it's been very pleasant for me over each decade to see a sudden shift. So in the 80s, people said, oh, how very interesting. Must be, must be a, a very useful work for, for, for treating mentally ill people. By the 90s, it was like, oh, that sounds so fascinating. Tell me, tell me exactly what it is you do and what's the difference between psychiatry and psychology. By the 2000s, it was like, oh my God, can you recommend a therapist for me? <laughs> and nowadays, when, when you introduce yourself as a psychotherapist, the person you're talking to says, I'm a psychotherapist as well. So <laughs> I, I have seen this shift decade by decade, and it's very, mm. it's very encouraging because I do remember those looks of utter disgust in the 1970s, and I had it very easy because if you go back and study the reception to the talking therapies in the 19, early 1900s, the 1910s, the 1920s, and so on, these early pioneers of the talking therapies were utterly reviled. Freud was considered a sexual pervert. They were, they were attacked. They were insulted. Uh, at one famous meeting, you may know from the Freud literature, uh, Freud's Hungarian colleague, uh, Dr. Sandor Ferenczi, uh, got up to give a paper, and one of the distinguished physicians in the audience said, this is not a matter for doctors. This is a matter for the police. <laughs> And that is, that is our history. So we have had to, we have had to be very brave to, mm. to throw our hats into the ring and practice this craft called psychotherapy, which now has a huge empirical basis. So we, we know that it really, really works. Thank you. So it's a, good, it's a good time to be coming into the field, and it's a good well, time to be in the field. As, as a young man, how did you actually get work as a psychotherapist? Because everybody always asks, how do I get referrals? How do I attract people to come to me? How, how did you go about doing that? Um, I, I, I didn't start out in, in private practice. I began as a research psychologist in, okay. in the National Health Service. So that helped me to develop my experience. I started out working with very severely psychotic patients. Uh, we don't have many of these patients nowadays who, who really suffer from lifelong catatonic schizophrenia. But I think I was probably the last generation who who did walk onto wards where the entire ward was literally in a, in a comatose, statue-like state. All the patients back then suffered from what is called tardive dyskinesia, where the overdose from the early, very primitive, over-administered neuroleptic medications would attack the muscles of the tongue. So you talk to the patients, and all their tongues would be hanging out. They could not speak coherently. You'd say, hello, my name is Brett Carr, and they'd go, uh, huh, uh, huh. So my first task in hospital was literally to try to find some verbal narrative coherency in these mm. people who were iatrogenically damaged for life because they were given these massive horse-like, elephant-like doses of, of the early, uh, these early neuroleptic uh, drugs. So we have moved on to a more sophisticated way of dealing with with the psychosis, but I started out in that kind of old school, sure, late sure. 19th century lunatic asylum. It was was built at the, the hospital I worked in was was built in the 18, 1840s. Um, so so that's how I got started, and I, it, it was really it wasn't until I was wasn't until I think I was in my very late 
activities that I took on my first independent patient. And that came through the clinic I was working at. When I left the clinic, mm -hmm. I received permission. This patient had not yet finished a long-term psychotherapy, and I was given permission to transfer this patient. Uh, the patient paid me absolutely no money at all, and I had to hire a consulting room and get supervision. So it was, it was a costly exercise, but the patient ultimately stayed with me for 10 years, and I learned an enormous amount about the craft of psychotherapy mm -hmm. and how one can really go on one hell of a journey and become a richer, fuller, person. And Sarah, when you gave your introduction and talked about the, the research from Massachusetts about how many times per session do, do people laugh, I, I think I can certainly say that, that the more an analysis unfolds and the more mentally healthy the patient becomes, the more you as the psychotherapist laugh because the patient has acquired a capacity for a good sturdy ego structure and a capacity for playfulness. You must see this in mm. your work, you must all see this in your work. So the, the, the older the analysis is, the longer the psychotherapy has gone on, the more scope there is for, for mm. joy and humor, which is, which is very nice. It's, a, it's quite an honor to be made to laugh by a patient who has a, a charming, delightful, playful story to tell. Not the defensive laugh that you see in, in very neurotic patients in the very first stages. In of psychotherapists. Treatment. Yes, and, and, in, <laughs> and, <laughs> and in psychotherapists, exactly, exactly. Uh, I think it's very important to have that experience. I had a bit of that experience because when I was 15, my father always sent me out to work, and I had a job at Christmas mm -hmm. in Rubery Psychiatric Hospital, which right. was a massive, right. massive thing just outside Birmingham, and we looked after the old people. It let the nurses go home for Christmas so mm. we could feed people. Yeah. And I enjoyed it. I loved it, mm. actually. And then I worked eight years in a community mental health team. And really, one of the things I found interesting there was we weren't supposed to get people better. We were just there to support people who were gravely mentally ill and lived in the community. And we, if they got better, sometimes they'd commit suicide. So we had a very strict balance about trying to cure people and mm. just supporting them. And it, it is interesting that maybe 2% of the population needs that support. It's quite a lot of people. And that's one of the roles of a psychotherapist, a pastoral role to just take care of people. Mm. Mm. But a lot of people come here today to find out how to thrive in their thing. So how do they actually get referrals? Because you, you got a lot of mentors helping you, didn't you? It's, it's an interesting question. I've, I've seen, because I've been a, a teacher of psychotherapy for such a long time, I've seen generations of students, I've seen my contemporaries, mm. and I know from my, my seniors how, how their practices came to develop. And, and no two practices will develop in, in quite the same way. And, and no two practices can develop quickly, nor should they develop quickly. Uh, you, you're, not, you're not skilled enough until you've seen your first cohort through. Mm. So I wouldn't recommend that a newly qualified psychotherapist be handed 40 patients all at once. You, you have to, it, it is something that has to develop mm. organically because you're carrying an increasing burden both intellectually and mm. affectively on your, on your shoulders and in your mind. And you need to have those psychological muscles to be able to manage it. Some of you may remember the name of John Clauber, who was for uh, many years a training analyst at the British Psychological Society and ultimately became its president and sadly d died at a, a relatively young age. But Dr. Clauber used to say that it takes 10 years to develop a psychotherapy practice psychoanalytical practice. And I think that's probably right. If, if you're looking for developing a full-time practice, I don't know anybody who's just suddenly full. I, I think one of the great mistakes that a very large number of young psychotherapists, and indeed middle-aged therapists, and indeed old psychotherapists have made, which, which I think can really damage a career in, in a, very, a very depressing way, is a lack of engagement with the rest of the profession. Yes. Yeah. 
Mm. I was so, because I was young and innocent and naive when I entered the field and just thought everything was utterly fascinating, I went to about 600 conferences a week. <laughs> I took notes. I bought everybody's book. Mm. At the end of the lecture, I went up and asked them to sign the book. So I, that's, see, that's what you're going to do next. <laughs> I, I, no, I, re I really, really did that. My, my whole library mm. is autographed. You know, I have John Bowlby's autograph mm. and R.D. Lang's autograph. You know, I, I, I met all these people mm. because I, I sought them out. I, they were great heroes to me, mm. and I wanted to meet them, and I literally wanted to shake their hand. I suppose I was a sort of celebrity junkie in, in that way, just as often people, you know, want to meet film stars and pop stars. I have no particular interest in meeting film stars or pop stars, though I admire their talent, but, but I do like meeting people who really have fine minds within the mental health community, and so I did. And because I went to so many lectures and went to all the conferences that, mm -hmm. I, that I could and, and met these people, you do become better educated. There's no doubt about it. Sure. So that when you then meet a senior person, you have things to say. So you can actually say, gosh, you were in supervision with John Bowlby. I had the privilege of meeting him last year. And he made a comment to the audience, da, 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 da. and suddenly, mm. you know, the older people clock you as somebody who is actually paying attention. I think it's a, a really, in many ways, as simple as that. And I, I think what I did in the early days, which was probably very, very important, is that I volunteered to be co-opted onto committees and to do you know, what really doesn't seem like particularly glamorous or interesting work. But somebody will say, oh, our newsletter is coming out next week, and we need somebody to write a 150-word summary of that conference. And I volunteered to do this. You know, it's, it's, it, people are always having a nightmarish time to try to get people to, to undertake these little administrative tasks. But I enjoyed it. And once you prove that you can be a reliable person, then people say, well, can you do a book review for us? Can you give a lecture? And, and then once you, you can demonstrate that you have a mind that works and you are educated, you get asked back and you get asked back and you get asked back. And th that's really how it unfolds. Mm -hmm. You do need to actually throw yourself into the intellectual content of the profession. You do need to read the journals. You do need to know who is the researcher for this topic and that topic. And you need to let your colleagues know that you know that. Not in a showing off kind of way, but just, just in a basic knowledge way. And I think because this is such a private, ghettoized profession, you know, there are days that go by where one patient comes in, goes out, another patient comes, you know, 12 hours can go by, and I don't see a single human being who is not one of my patients. So we are very isolated in that way. We don't work in big, big offices with, with uh, lots of hot desking going on. So we have to really work very hard to become known by our collegial network. And I think one of the chapters in this book on how to flourish as a psychotherapist, of which I'm most proud is, is the one where I actually did an audit of my own referrals. Yeah. Where do they come from? Because I think people, people think, you know, all, all you have to do is, you know, appear on television and then a million people will contact you. And without question, I think it was something like 70% of the referrals. I, I audited my last 500 referrals over several years. And they, the vast majority came from fellow mental health professional colleagues. So you have to be in the community. You have to know one another. So tonight, after the lecture is over, don't, don't talk to me or Martin and Sarah. Talk to your neighbors and, and introduce yourselves to one another. I really, really mean that. You, you have to be known within your network. Yes. And one of the things we're trying to do at the UKCP is to help people set up um, group practices. Because it's very difficult, I think, working from home on your own. It, it, People can come into your home who can jigger you, who can haunt you. You have clients who will haunt you. But if you're in a group practice with other people, it, it's, it's much less of a stress on your psyche, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's more fun because at some point you're going to have to, you know, it's great to giggle with, with friends, etc. You can't do that on your own. And frankly, we cruise the fridge. We tend to be at home... Sticking our heads in the fridge, right? 
Uh, that's as bad as it gets, but it's not good. It's not a healthy lifestyle, as I'm a test. I attest to the years of that. Um, so I, I completely can go with you. It's, it's colleagues, friends, perhaps you write a few things, people come towards you. But what you've done, I mean, Brett has enormous energy. You do how many hours a, a, a week do you deliver therapies? 35, uh, something uh, like that? Uh, 40. 40, 35, 40. Write books, you get up early, study. I mean, one of the things in, in this book is your idea of how to read psychotherapy. I mean, do, you, do you want to say a bit, a bit about that? Mm -hmm. No, thank you for asking about reading. It's my, it's my greatest uh, delight and, and, and joy. It's also been my greatest source of education. I, I always wince when I hear fellow psychotherapy colleagues say, well, you know, I don't really need to keep up with the literature. I don't really have to study because I just feel it in the countertransference. I know what's going on. And I'm, I'm sure we do feel things in the countertransference. But there is a literature, 125 years old now mm. and every single clinical article that is written today has already been preceded by Sigmund Freud and the early generation of practitioners and I, I think it's scholarly irresponsible of us as professionals if we are endeavoring to become a profession that can one day hold its head alongside accountants and lawyers and doctors and and rock stars you know well-established professions mm. because we are we are a young profession. We're a new profession. Medicine is many thousands of years old, so we have a long way to go. And I think unless we can demonstrate our intellectual rigor and robustness, we, we will not be taken as seriously as we can. So I think we have to read. And I am always horrified when I meet with students and supervisees mm. at how little read they are. And, I, you know, I was, I was quite... Uh, I, w I was quite finger-wagging as, uh, as, as a lecturer to young students, saying, you know, look, this, this summer you've got, you've got six weeks off. It's probably not enough time to read the complete works of Sigmund Freud and Carl Gustav Jung, but Melanie Klein's works are compressed into four volumes. You can definitely read four books in six weeks. Mm. Please come back in September having read the complete works of Melanie Klein. And I'm not even a card-carrying Kleinian, but, but we, we, don't, we, don't read, we don't read enough as a profession, and certainly Certainly, if I have had any degree of, of success or, or creativity or flourishing in my career, I promise you that having been a reader and having been a scholar of this field has helped me to get writing invitations and speaking invitations. Okay. Absolutely. We, we ha please, just, just buy every book that, that you see here tonight and, 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 and go home and read. We, we, don't, we don't read enough. It's, 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 it's a secret about the profession that very few people are willing to talk about. But, you know, and I, I can see the difference in my supervisees over the years because when, when, I, when I facilitate a supervision session, I'm constantly referring to the literature. I said, ah, well, what the patient has just said there, that there's an exact uh, similarity in Paula Heim 1957 paper and you should read that and the students who actually take out their pens and pads and write down the reference and then come back the next week and said I read Paula Hyman's article in the International Journal of Psychoanalysis you're right that's exactly what my patient was doing they are the ones who really really flourish and do good clinical work the students who just sit there and and don't write down the reference and say oh okay yeah the, 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 you, I, I would never refer patients to, to those students. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. This, this is an academic discipline as well as a clinical discipline. And I think we find that because we are coming from a touchy-feely background where we're dealing with powerful emotions and traumatic stories, it doesn't mean that we can't also be academically rigorous as well as deeply empathic and compassionate. We need both of those qualities, both sides of the brain. Yes, and you need strength as well, don't you? I mean, there's a lot of people who... Uh, get overwhelmed easily and really you do develop a, a hell of a strength of, of well people tell you stuff and you've, mm. you've heard these horrors before sometimes something creeps in underneath mm -hmm. you know little bits and bobs but you have to develop that strength because if you can't hold the boundaries and go with go with somebody on their journey if you're balking against some traumatic story that they can't really win I, I think it is difficult but we need to be more scholastic I, I, I believe and if you're an analyst, which you are and I'm not, you have a whole history to go through and lots of mentors. But somebody like myself who's humanistic, uh, we don't have that in the same way. 
because the humanistic thing dissolved mostly by about 1970. It had such a powerful explosion and then petered out. Um, I don't know why I'm saying that, actually, but uh, I have that sort of envy of that. Even the Jungians don't have that track. So you've got a sort of deep history there to deal with. H history is vital, and I think mm. it's vital whether one is a Freudian, whether one's mm. a Rogerian, whatever one's orientation. There is a history in every branch yes. and every orientation. Yes. And I think to not spend your time swimming in that history and, and learning as much as you can about that. Mm. I, I say to my colleagues that you know every day in the consulting room, I take Freud with me, I take Winnicott with me, I take Bowlby with me. They're all sitting on my <coughs> shoulders and mm. I, I hear them talking because as a patient is, as a patient is uh, narrating, mm. yes, I scrutinize my counter-transference and I'm listening to their narrative, but I'm also thinking, ah, oh, in 1963, John Bowlby wrote about exactly this phenomenon. He invented the wheel before I did. There's no reason why we need to constantly reinvent the wheel. We have an enormous amount of clinical and scientific data already published and on our bookshelves, but I don't think we, I don't think we draw upon it enough. I, I can say, although I've had some of the very best clinical supervisors, uh, mm. uh, I, I adore my supervisors. I've just dedicated my last book to, to four of my most uh, impactful, influential ones. The people who have taught me the most about the practice of psychotherapy are Sigmund Freud and his early colleagues, none of whom I met personally, all of whom are deceased, most of whom lived in Vienna. But those are the people who have supervised my work more than anybody else. Uh, I think it's a great time now to start hearing from you and just getting some questions in here. Do you, do you want to field these? Yeah, could, could, could we have the lights up ever so slightly? Then we can see if anyone wants to put their... Yes, I can't see anyway, yeah, so... Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, anyone have any questions for Martin or for Brett? Please. Right. Um, I came on tonight because I'm, I'm a therapist in private practice in East London, no problem filling up my practice, it's very busy there, but I want to diversify and that's what attracted me to tonight's talk. I was quite interested in, I think I read in your book when I was going through it that you've done some research, your project yourself, I think, and I was curious how do you get into that sort of thing or the writing and getting paid for it. I mean, I've offered to write stuff for therapy today and it's all like, Lots of free things, which I understand can be roots into things, but at this stage, I'm, you know, wanting to limit my one-to-one -one work for more sort of getting more balance in my own life and doing more writing. But how, how, what are the ways into the paid work in terms of research and writing? I guess is what I'm more curious about. That, that's a, it's a great question, and and that is that is really the reason I. I wrote this book is to really try to describe some of the journeys because they they often happen quite quite unexpectedly for for instance I I've done a lot of work consulting to the media, and I worked for the BBC for several years as as resident psychotherapist on on BBC Radio 2 I had never planned to do anything with the media when I when I first discovered Freud and decided to to gravitate into the mental health profession. None of my teachers ever mentioned the media that working with the media was was a possibility. Uh, I literally, at the age of I think I must have been about twenty one, I was invited on one of the local BBC radio stations to talk about a lecture that I had arranged. There were, there were no psychoanalytical speakers at my university at all, and I decided to take the initiative and set up a weekly psychoanalytical forum on a budget of, of, of tuppence halfpenny. And I wrote to the world's most famous psychoanalyst, and I said, would you like to come to my university and give a talk? And they were all honored and delighted. I paid, I paid for their train fare from my own tiny, tiny, student grant and took them out to dinner from my own student grant and it was a wonderful experience and I learnt I learnt an enormous amount from that kind of contact you know at 21 I had I had dinner with John Bowlby and and, and Ronnie Lang it was, these were these were remarkable experiences and I felt that I was starting to belong to this professional family and one of the people I invited was the notorious Professor Hans Isink 
who was the head of the psychology department at the Institute of Psychiatry, the leading clinical psychologist in Great Britain throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, a rabid anti-Freudian. And he was at that point about to publish a book called Decline and Fall of the Freudian Empire. <laughs> and in an effort to be open-minded and also perhaps to please some of my more stodgy uh, college teachers who loved Hans Eysenck and hated Freud, I invited him and he gave a talk called How Wrong Was Freud? And the local radio station got word of this that Eysenck, who was probably then the most famous academic psychologist in this country, that he was coming to an old university and slagging off Freud at a Freud study group. So they invited me to come on the radio. And I spoke on the radio, never having been on radio before, but, uh, but I knew the subject and I was able to talk about it coherently. And BBC Radio invited me back on a month later and it just kind of escalated from there. It literally came about in a very, very unexpected way. And then once you've done five radio appearances and 10 radio appearances, you have a voice and you know how to do it. You're not sitting there petrified checking your notes. You know how to do it. So one thing leads to another. So you do have to put your head above the parapet. You do have to be brave and take the initiative to start a venture. I think if I had not started in a way, having started that study group, which I paid for myself uh, with, with help from nobody and, in fact, quite a lot of opposition from my professors who thought, why are you wasting your time inviting Freudians to our university? We hate the Freudians, but, but I was quite passionate about it and I knew there would be an audience among the students and the members of the local community. It, it really opened up my media career and it really promulgated my interest in history, and I've written a number of books on the history of our field, because I met some of these great historical figures, all of whom are now deceased. So it proved to be a very good training. So you, you can't wait for the telephone to ring. It's a bit like out-of-work actors who sit at home all day. How many of you have patients who are out-of-work actors? 90% of actors are always out of work at every moment, and many of them come to us very, very depressed in a deeply passive state because they say, well, you know, my agent hasn't rung in six weeks. My agent hasn't rung in 12 weeks. I left, sent him an email and he still hasn't rung. And, you know, I, I often think about somebody like Sir Kenneth Branagh, who is, of course, a very competent, <laughs> accomplished, talented person. But he set up his own theater company. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm not going to wait for agents to sit and call me. Mm -hmm. And he founded the Renaissance Theater Company, and he was able to use that as a forum for displaying his considerable abilities. And, and now he is he's a legend. So we, 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 have to, we have to actually take that authority. You cannot wait for your career to happen to you. You actually have to be very active and shape it. And that, I think, really lies at the heart of flourishing as opposed to being in a state of stagnation. Thank you. I'm a, a friend of mine, uh, she's French, sorry, she's American, but she lives in France, comes over here, works here, works in France. And she set up herself in practice by giving lectures at the Kensington Ladies Guild. She just wrote to him and said, I'm a psychotherapist, I'd love to tell you about what we do and give lectures. And all these women were fascinated by it, and she just set up a practice mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. on that. Uh, I started the, the Long Boat Home just simply by phoning up loads and loads of psychotherapists and saying, if we had a veteran come to see you, would you work for free or for a very low cost? I said, yeah, absolutely. 800 people said yes, and that was it. Um, and that positioned me in, in a different way. Mm. You know, uh, I became an authority on veterans' issues. Um, but, you know, it didn't take much, but you have to start it. It's like Greek gods. They never interfere until you do something. Then they'll just might nudge your sword a little bit, you know, so you, you can kill your opponent. But they don't mm. actually, they're not like Christian or Jewish people. They just never get involved. They just mm. watch. But once you start something, they're with you. Okay. There was another question over there. I don't really have a question. I just have a comment. And I, I don't want to sound defensive. I'm conscious that I might sound defensive. I love what I do as a psychotherapist. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of things I would like to do. But I'm not able to 
you know, one of the things that drew me here tonight was the content, very interested to come, but also it's very affordable. I'd love to do more CPD, it's very expensive. UK CP membership is very expensive for me. Supervision is expensive. Like many people in the room, I'm sure, I work hard and I, my, my source of income comes from various places. So I do bread and butter work for employee assistance programs that don't pay particularly well, but it's a regular source of income. I'm signed up with health insurance companies and I have a private practice. Um, you know, I've been wanting, and, and I know I procrastinate, so this is my stuff as well. In the last few weeks, I keep needing to update my profile on the council directory. I haven't got the headspace for this sometimes. I do buy books, and I do read, but I don't read as much as I'd like to, because I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired. I don't have time. You know, and then when I, and I work from home, and I get your point, Martin, but I work, you know, I work from home because it's it's my I'm fortunate that I have space at home and you know, I manage the sort of energy in my workroom and I close the door. When I log off on a Friday, I am not logging back on, I don't walk in that room till Monday. So the things that I might do, I don't because I'm trying so hard to get my own balance, mm. my mental health, my self care. That you know, and then working in a in a group like that however you describe it, great, but it wouldn't allow me to start work at 8 o'clock and finish work at 7.30, 8 o'clock. I don't work flat out all day, but I have that flexibility. Today I saw seven patients because I started at 8 and managed to spread them out and finish in time to come here. Mm. So I don't know what I'm trying to say, except it's not as easy yeah. <laughs> or accessible uh, as I, I wish it was. You know, but it's about choice sometimes, isn't it? That we have to. You know, EAPs don't pay it very well, and I know this will sound offensive, but my training was about six and a half years. If we include the free 450 clinical hours, I can't afford to do any more free work. Sure. Sure. I'd like, you know. Sure. I can't. Sorry, I just I didn't want to run. <laughs> <laughs> No, what you're what you're saying is huge. What you're saying is hugely important, and this is this is the reality of this. And I hope that I wasn't suggesting that doing uh, activities is easy. It's 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 bloody hard. Everybody I know who has succeeded has worked, you know, like a lunatic, like a Trojan, over many many years. You know, uh, I, I work full time with patients. Uh, my writing is done in stolen moments. I, th I think your your very good observation raises a number of points. One is about appetite. And not every psychotherapist, not every member of our field is required to have the same degree of appetite. Some people are hugely passionate about the work and very ambitious and want to become the next chair of the UKCP or what have you, and uh, you know, the new Sigmund Freud. And others could care less. I, I mean, it was very, very sobering for me when I taught quite regularly back in the old days and had groups of of, of third and fourth year students and I would try to confer some sort of patronage because I would be on the editorial board of a journal and I'd say to a group of students, you know, who, who wants to write a book review for the next issue of the journal? It'll really be good for your profile. And uh, some, you know, jumped at the chance and were only too happy to be given this opportunity by an, an older mentor. And others said, you know what? I have no interest in doing that whatsoever. I only came into this because I want to help patients get better. And, and one is entitled to do that. I do think that it is helpful that you have a senior mentor who you can talk to about your career, about what your secret appetite is. We all have supervisors with whom we talk about our cases, but we don't have career supervisors. And I do think that that is a very, very mm. important factor. I have more and more people coming to me to say, can I see you not for clinical supervision, but for career supervision? Because mm. I, I would like to be doing more of X, but I don't know how to get started. I mm. would like to be doing more than Y. And often it is about being put in touch with people 
often it is about trying to get to the underbelly of whether you are in a state of neurotic inhibition, frightened of an envious attack if you do make your project sail, uh, because, because there, there's a lot of envy in our profession, as there is in all human relationships. So I do think one needs a good conversation with a, with a, with a, a mentor who is already connected and who can, can help you find, find roots in. It's not something one can do in, in isolation at all. Right. Well, um, I want to thank you, all of you um, for your tremendous contribution for creating such a lovely, warm environment here in this lovely, uh, red, rich space to have this uh, absolutely fascinating conversation. And, and thank you very much, Brett and Martin, for such an interesting discussion. Well, thank you, sir. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Uh, and this is staying open for some time, so if you want to have a drink at the bar, they sell crisps if you're hungry. Um, but, uh, and have a chat to each other, see if you can get yes. some referrals. <laughs> Are you going to pop out and sign some books? Yeah. Good.